I'm Sean Norris. I'm the field CIO for Pivotal covering Asia Pacific. I'm based in Singapore. This is my fifth DevOps Enterprise Summit. I was at the first one way back in, in San Francisco in 2014. And it's the fifth one, the fourth one here in the US. And it's a real privilege to be here and introduce my friend and uh, you know, kind of working partner, Dapeng Liu from DBS. Dapeng, do you want to uh, introduce yourself quickly, please? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dapeng. I'm from uh, DBS Bank, Singapore. So I came all the way. Uh, from Singapore to here, just to share some interesting stories that uh, we think is uh, uh, worth sharing. Uh, I lead the group's uh, credit risk development team, and uh, 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 maybe we'll actually talk about more about uh, what's going on, right? So, <laughs> so we're just uh, waiting for our slides to come up. Um, one of the, uh, this will be really fun if we do 30 minutes with no slides. We probably can, because we've done a dry run. But uh, you know, the, the interesting thing, when, when Dapeng and I got together and, and had coffee in Singapore six or seven months ago now and started this idea of doing this talk together, it was really based around the idea of the Accelerate book. So the work that Dr. Nicole Forsgren and team have done, if you saw her talk yesterday, it was great. Um, the, the work they've done was fantastic. And, that book has been something that as I go around and talk to customers and in my roles working for large banks in the past, that was um, really informative and especially kind of these big four metrics. So when I got talking to Dapeng from DBS and he started telling me the transformation story that they've been on over the last really two and a half, three years, I was like, this sounds to me like one of those elite performers that we read about in the state of DevOps reports. And in the uh, and in the accelerate book, so you know, let's let's start at the end of the story in terms of business outcomes. This is really a technology talk, but you know, in July this year, uh, first of all, how many people have heard of DBS? Wow, <laughs> that's that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so DBS is Development Bank of Singapore. It's it's one of the you know uh, I'll let Dapeng explain a little more, but maybe let's start with talking about the award that DBS won in July yep. this year. Yep. Uh, can we have the slide, please? Oops. Looks like we may actually have some slides. Oh, they went. Okay, so uh, this year we have uh, achieved the global recognition. Uh, being recognized as the best bank in the world. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so, so that was the uh, that was a magazine in in the European Union called Euro Money. Yep. And in July of this year, they voted DBS Bank the best bank in the world. So you may not have heard of them, but hopefully you'll go look that up and reference it. And. You know, I, I think we're going to use that as a kind of placeholder. We're not going to kind of go into balance sheet reading and prove to you that the kind of the, the DevOps outcomes talked about in Accelerate are, are definitely in place. But let's just use that as a placeholder and agree that DBS is one of the trendsetters. They're one of the elites in the banking world. And so, you know, as we go back and kind of remind ourselves of what Accelerate talks us talks to us about. I was hoping to have uh, the big four metrics up here, but um, since we don't, you know, remember what they are. I've talked about them enough that they should come straight to me. There's really one on throughput and one on stability. So, so you got two metrics on throughput. This is how long does it take you to get a change into production, and then how often do you go to production? You know, in, in a lot of the organizations I've been part of, the uh, speed that you went to production was maybe every month. And we're going to hear from DBS kind of that was the position they were in, in, in you know, a couple of years ago. And yet, you also, it's not good enough just to have lots of throughput and be going really fast. You also need stability. And so the, the other two of the kind of these four key metrics really talk about um, how fast do you recover if something breaks and how often do things break when you go to production. So what's your, what's your change failure rate and how fast do you recover? So those four metrics, uh, I, I'm hearing a lot more about them as I go around and talk to customers across Asia. And you know, if we go in then and look at DBS, if, if we put this, I want to use this Accelerate report or the State of DevOps report as kind of a backdrop for what we're going to kind of dive into and talk about what DBS have been up to. So um, it seems we're still uh, slideless and timeless, so we may go on all afternoon. Um, <laughs> you can leave whenever you're bored. But uh, you know, in the... In the Accelerate book, the punchline is really this, that if you adopt DevOps practices and principles, you are going to improve your uh, delivery capability 
of software and operations, and that in turn is going to improve your business outcomes. That you're, however you measure that, whether it's profit, revenue, you know, turnover, etc. So, you know, we, we've already kind of gone to the end of that story and talked about how DBS was voted best bank in the world this year. But maybe let's talk about what are some of the specific principles and practices you, your team picked up, Deping, over the past couple of years. Yeah, so uh, since I'm not from the marketing department, so I'll just leave the so-called uh, sales talk to my marketing department. By no means, I want to steal that job. <laughs> so uh, uh, giving you an example, right? So uh, what we have uh, been and what we are now. Uh, I joined the bank about three years ago. So uh, back then, uh, our in-house developed so-called legacy uh, credit approval application. It, it, it was about 8 million lines of code. Uh, .NET, uh, .NET framework, right? ASP.NET, don't judge, actually, uh, you know. It, it, it was really, really painful. Uh, then we cannot afford to have more than one release every month uh, into production. So uh, we used to have this uh, tradition saying that every time we go into production, we need to have a party because it's just like way too much uh, effort that to put in. Then uh, we need to give ourselves a, a pat on the back. Uh, so now, uh, we are talking about, like after, after three years of uh, development, we are talking about uh, almost 100 times into production every month. So uh, if you do the math, uh, and since we only do like uh, uh, weekday de uh, deployment, we don't actually do a Saturday, Sunday, and uh, we actually are talking about like um, about four times a day into production. So uh, that's uh, where we have the, uh, the title from, uh, 10 times a year into four times a day. But then uh, it, the, these two numbers look very close to each other. However, it doesn't need to be so if you just like change the unit. So if you actually convert that four times a day into uh, a year, then that's roughly about 1,000 times a year. So we, we have some slides up now. So you know, a really quick, <laughs> a really quick rundown. We, we actually don't have a monitor here, so we're going to do the awkward thing and look behind us. But um, you know, really, if you think about it in, in, in the accelerate backdrop, like lead time went from 32 hours down to three, and release effort went from 12 to two, and infrastructure provisioning now, instead of taking a week, happens the same day. And, and so what, when we talk about those things, we talked about these already, and you've seen these slides as well. This is some fantastic material. If you've not seen these, go download them from the Dora report, read them, take them back, share copies in your organization. Um, we talked about the punchline and, and why it matters to every business. So then, you know, we, we, we're, we kind of got to this point in our slides where DBS has been doing things like using cloud native architecture, using a PaaS, using private cloud and automated delivery pipelines and self-service of infrastructure provisioning. All the stuff that you kind of read in the state of DevOps reports and the Accelerate books saying these are good things and they're correlated with high performance. We now have you know, a real life example of a team in a highly regulated complex financial services industry that are doing these things. They're achieving these sorts of improvements in their technical outcomes and you know, like we talked about, they voted best bank in the world. So as we, as we kind of thought about how to structure this and only having, well, less than 30 minutes now, um, you know, there are seven key areas that the Accelerate book talks about in terms of practice areas that you want to think about adopting if you're going to get on the path to be one of, one of these elite performers. And we wanted to pick two, and we also wanted to talk about both dev and ops but shade it a little more towards ops because it's maybe the forgotten part sometimes of the DevOps story in terms of like, what are platform teams doing? What are infrastructure teams doing to, to help achieve these improvements in delivery? And so we want to zone in on two specific things. One is how DBS adopted a platform as a service. And the second is what sort of things are they doing around infrastructure as code? So let's talk about infrastructure as code first. Infrastructure as code, you know, really the, the Accelerate book tells us that if your teams are manipulating their infrastructure as code, they're almost twice as likely to be an elite performer as, than if they don't. And so, especially having declarative version controlled environments, if you managed to see my colleague uh, Cornelia Davis's talk yesterday, fantastic on using Kubernetes and having a declarative functional model for managing your infrastructure. So, you know, that's the theory, but 
Let's hear from Dapeng and DBS on what sort of things have they actually done around infrastructure as code? Yeah, so uh, from the self-provisioning point of view, we do have uh, Cloud Foundry to help us to uh, kind of like provision a com uh, compute, RAM, and a disk. Uh, however, actually, uh, we think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole uh, software development as a whole, then, then suddenly you think that, in a sense that, uh, Infrastructure shouldn't necessarily only be uh, classified as only about uh, the hardware or the or, or the, so the computers, but also uh, the stuff that's actually uh, relevant to the uh, code, but it's not part of the code. So therefore, actually, we think about that pipeline, also the automation part of it, should be also considered as the uh, as the uh, part of uh, the infrastructure. And uh, uh, these days. These days, we spend enough effort to make it real in a sense that you can, you can automate uh, not only about the environment uh, provisioning, but also the rest of the stuff. Think about like a uh, provisioning of the Git repository, provisioning of the uh, um, pipeline, which uh, does the build, does the test, does the uh, scan, does the, uh, uh, does the deployment, right? And uh, uh, until now, we have about 260 live uh, repositories living uh, in, in our kind of like a live code base. And then there's another, there's another 130 uh, code repositories have already been uh, decommissioned. So if you do the math, uh, put it into perspective, that's about 400 repositories in, uh, in three years' time. So uh, let's, let's, do the, let's assume people work like about 270 days a, a year. That's about 800 uh, days. And then therefore, it's like every other day, we have putting on a new uh, repository. So, um, uh, it, this kind of like uh, activities start becoming a norm. And uh, for the uh, uh, pipeline perspective, we have the one-to-one -one mapping from the uh, code repository towards the pipeline. So every, every one of them will be actually backed up by exactly one pipeline. And uh, every time there's a push into our uh, uh, bit the repository, uh, the pipeline will be automatically triggered. So uh, in last month alone, we have managed to push into our testing environment no less than 2,000 times. So uh, this has actually a fundamental kind of differences than the, than the old legacy application that we were doing. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Very cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this pipeline automation. This is pretty cool. You were sharing with me how before, when it took a long time to get a pipeline, you ended up with really kind of giant microservices. I think this would be a great kind of anecdote to share with, uh, with the community. Yeah, so uh, the uh, story hasn't been always this romantic. <laughs> so uh, you all start up, uh, we, all know, we all start up with, with something. So uh, one seven, we had uh, some uh, so-called microservices, but uh, in, by no means uh, they are micro. So uh, the bigger ones uh, has uh, hundreds of uh, controllers in, uh, tons of people working in the same uh, repository, and then people are competing with uh, the uh, uh, merge conflicts, right? So uh, because there's so many branches going on. So uh, we said, uh, uh, despite the, actually the constant emphasis about putting up the right architecture, uh, doing microservices right, and then uh, we don't actually see people actually uh, spin up new repositories. And uh, in a sense, in a sense that we, are, we were uh, right into the trajectory of being a certified monolith, right? So, uh, so then uh, we kind of like uh, uh, sat down and then talk about this uh, problem. Uh, why uh, do we think uh, there are some good things that we need to do, but the people choose not to do so? So then, uh, then uh, we had this conversation. I think this is one of the most important uh, conversation I ever had for the uh, whole development. Uh, in a sense, uh, we say, what is the reason why people wouldn't want to spin up the new repository since uh, given the fact that the uh, code base is, has already grown a little bit too big? And uh, the, the feedback was, hey, guess what? I only need to spend about 100 lines to get my uh, uh, ticket out of, the, uh, out of my hand. But, uh, but the setting up the pipeline took, took me about three days. So, uh, in terms of this uh, risk of war, it doesn't really kind of like gel in, right? So then suddenly uh, that kind of like realization kick in, in a sense that um, just because this something is right, <laughs> just because doing something is right does not mean that people will do so if it is not easy to do. So then we say, okay, let's stand down and then kind of like uh, uh, streamline the uh, pipeline setting up. 
And then, then uh, more and more kind of microservices start to pop in. Actually, these days, if you set up a new pipeline, it takes you no more than five seconds. Uh, then uh, if you actually kick in the pipeline and run it in the, in the kind of like the whole, pipe, uh, whole uh, testing uh, environment, it, it takes you about 10, uh, 10 something minutes from end to end. The very beginning of when you're having a, a, a application running locally uh, on the port 8080 given the JDBC URL. So that's all you need to have a, a, a pipeline. Uh, however, there's another problem kick in, right? So uh, as uh, more and more pipelines uh, we are putting into the, uh, into the uh, environment, we figure uh, every uh, microservices has their own uh, little kind of like pipeline specific, uh, specification or definition file. And uh, uh, upon about 50 to 70, we feel that it, it is uh, becoming a little bit un, uh, unmaintainable uh, because every now and then there will be a little bit of a tweak of the bespoke requirement for the need of the requirement, uh, for the need of the pipeline. So then uh, we say, uh, what can we do? All right, so uh, uh, then uh, we figure out actually there's a way to inherit all of the pipelines. Uh, then for each and every uh, one of them, you don't have to uh, put out the full-blown definition. You, you probably can only, uh, I mean, it is sufficient for you to only provide the necessary uh, key piece of information. What are the, uh, where are the pipelines? Where do you want to, uh, sorry, where's your code? Where do you want to deploy that? Right, so uh, it, it's actually a very iterative approach. We never actually uh, anticipated to uh, land in such a situation now. Uh, today we have all of the, our kind of like a, uh, 200 something uh, re repositories with 200 something pipelines. They all inherit from a single kind of like a, uh, master definition. The rest of them, you don't really have to do anything. So uh, uh, as, as I said, right, it's actually a kind of very iterative approach as of, as of we go. We figure out more problems, and then we try to find a solution to solve it. Very cool. So the other kind of key part of the story is you know, the use of platform as a service. And if we kind of refer back to this backdrop of the Accelerate book and the State of DevOps reports, you know, teams using platforms as a service in last year's report were one and a half times more likely to be elite performers. And you know, our theory is that this is likely because developers are spending more time above that value line and less time wrangling infrastructure and doing kind of non-value added heavy lifting. Um, I, I think you're going to be enjoying hearing about you know, how DBS has, has been on this journey as well. So, so Deping, share with us a little bit about kind of how the platform has enabled your team. Yeah, so uh, as a development manager, I actually put myself in a sense, uh, in, a, in a position where uh, my job is there to optimize a developer's time. So uh, I really want them to focus on one thing, which is basically dealing with the business logic other than uh, anything else. In this case, uh, I'm talking about back to the uh, uh, context of the uh, past. In this case, um, specifically, it's a cloud foundry. And uh, here on the stuff that actually we are enjoying in a, in a daily basis. Uh, first, uh, about the kind of like, uh, uh, abstraction of the, uh, of, of the environment. You don't have to uh, kind of like call anybody to spin up the environment to uh, run your application. All you need to do is specify how many uh, uh, RAM, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is the uh, disk requirement, and then boom, uh, there you go. You have your environment running. And then uh, we don't have a way in this, in this case, it's more like a, it, it started was a shortcoming where uh, we don't have the persistent storage. So uh, it turns out to be a very good kind of like a, a constraint in a sense. It cultivates the right design of the application to be uh, more like a, towards the stateless spectrum of it. So uh, we can easily kind of spin more and more uh, services scaling. And another very uh, key point uh, for all of the uh, achievements so far is about the uh, control of the DNS layer where we do have the capability to manipulate the, the route, uh, and the, in this case, the, the, uh, the load balancing algorithm. And therefore, this gives us the capability to do blue-green deployment. So with all the 1,000 deployment that happens every month, uh, they all happen at like uh, 2 p.m. during office hour. So we don't have uh, to request uh, a special kind of downtime. So uh, coming back to our kind of like interesting tradition, right? We used to have this uh, tradition, let's go for a party after each deployment. And, uh, and I don't think uh, as a bank, we do have that kind of money to uh, host that many uh, 
kind of like <laughs> parties <laughs> after each and every deployment. And uh, even, even if we do, uh, there's a physical limitation of uh, people's belly, right? How much uh, can you stuff, stuff in? So, so, yeah. so this is literally like deployment was so rare and so special that you used to throw a party every time. Yeah. This is like two years ago. And it used to be at you know 11.30 on a Saturday night in a green window. Yeah. And now, how many times a day on average are you going? So uh, in a day, it's actually about uh, four to five. Uh, and sometimes, actually, can shoot up to 20 something. So yeah, uh, just think about uh, uh, 20 parties in a day. Wow. <laughs> and so, so this is around like 140 applications in production and 600 containers. So it's, it's a sizable chunk of, uh, yeah. of business logic. Actually, a special shout out for the concept of uh, build pack. For those of you who are not very familiar with Cloud Foundry, uh, it has a very interesting uh, characteristic where the containers are built inside the um, platform uh, instead of outside the platform. So uh, as a developer, I don't really need to do anything but to just specify, uh, here's my code, right? run that on the platform for me. I don't have to specify the uh, uh, base image. I don't have to specify the user. I, you, uh, user ID, uh, we, uh, I, don't, I, don't spe I don't need to specify the, all the, let's say, the GVM uh, uh, flags and, 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 and the switches. And I don't even need to specify like which port, right? X ports. All of these things has been taken care of by, by the platform. So, so it's just a huge uh, time saver for all yeah. of the developers. Speaking of time savers, I'm going to let you in on the kind of behind the scenes speaking gig here. You know, Gene talked about, you know, you sometimes want to step over the other side of the velvet rope. Well, our clock just came back on and we have 10 minutes left. So let's, let's crack on and go through. There's a few more things. We want to talk quickly about things like incident management and legacy processes like change management as well, because, you know, this is a bank. It's a traditional organization that's been around for a long time. And as you can imagine, kind of ITIL traditional processes are still kind of the norm through, through lots of technology. So let's talk about incident management. Let's, let's kind of quickly go through and kind of explain how incident management has improved as you've been on this journey. So now I have another interesting story I want to share with, with all of you. Uh, we used to have this uh, reporting module uh, under the very uh, subtle circumstances. And a, one of the query will file up, uh, and it will take way too long to kind of run the query, and then it will uh, eat up way too much memory. And uh, as a result, uh, and the, this application actually crashed in production environment. Uh, while in the, uh, in the old days legacy uh, world, uh, a crashing uh, running out of memory is going to be uh, something's going to be triggering the whole world, right? So boiling the whole ocean already. And uh, uh, fortunately, we run in multiple instances of this uh, report uh, uh, module. And uh, no one was actually raising an uh, incident report to us. And it's, all, it's more like our uh, kind of platform operation team start to alerting us and saying that, hey, guess what? There is one of your microservices start crashing now. Then we sort of like uh, go in and take a look, oh, what happened? So now we do have the option to say that, okay, so in case of these uh, uh, like uh, catastrophic failures out of memory, stuff like this, the platform is there to help us to automatically revive the uh, failure service so that we don't have to kind of like immediately uh, putting everybody into the uh, war, uh, war room and figure out what happened next. And we do have the capability to kind of say that, okay, so in this case, let's understand the problem first. And then uh, we have the option to take uh, actions whether immediately or actually maybe can, can do that later. And another interesting thing uh, uh, I observe uh, is more like uh, uh, these days we, uh, we are talking about rolling back uh, less and less often. We're talking more about rolling forward, right? Anyway, we are going to roll, so uh, why uh, roll backwards? Let's roll forward. Understand the problem, and fix it, and then kind of like move on. Uh, so from the traditional kind of incident management point of view, it used to be a very reactive process. Now we try, to, we try we're not, there, not completely there yet. We try to be a little bit more proactive, preemptive, to figure out, as of the application running, what's happening there. And change management is another kind of topic that I think a lot of people in the room are probably still grappling with to some degree. And so kind of talk of some of the tactical things you've done around improving change management, even though you haven't quite got to where you want to yet. Yeah. So uh, after all, as I said, we are still the bank. Uh, we are, we are, I, my team, at least my team, is not here to break all the glasses, right, to kind of like uh, accept a lot of uh, risk control people. So we still follow the, exactly the, uh, the process that has been set up for the bank. 
And uh, uh, one of the key uh, pain points for the team is uh, to raise the form, right? So uh, going into production, uh, we have to raise actually uh, several forms. And uh, uh, over the many years, there are many, many different fields being put up into the form. And uh, just because you have the right information does not necessarily mean that you will know how to fill up the form. <laughs> so uh, people actually are joking that it takes some uh, serious art to uh, kind of fill up the form in a sense that people won't, won't reject it. So uh, the most of the error happens in a sense that it always happens in, uh, in a way where people fill up the right information into the wrong field. So we say, okay, so what can we do to uh, uh, ease the pain, right? So uh, end up like uh, all of the information that's needed to fill up the form is already there in our code repository. So then, uh, okay, that's easy. Then we just write a generator, or some uh, little uh, automation script to automatically fill up the form in a sense that uh, the right information will fill up into the right field and then the right sequence of the events will happen exactly the way it needs to be. Then uh, it help us a lot to kind of like uh, by submitting the, the, uh, the change request, uh, the chances of getting get that change request to be re rejected is actually very, very low now. And uh, uh, for now, uh, preparing a change request takes about like a, uh, the upfront uh, uh, takes about five minutes to 10 minutes to put up a, a, a single change request, and then we don't really have any rejection uh, these days anymore. Yeah. So along with the kind of specific technical kind of principle, or the, the process changes you've done in, in the ways of working, I found it really interesting when we talked about this before, the, the, the culture changes that have happened. And sort of three themes came out around you know, your team topology or structure, and then what's happened to the team around things like sustainable pace and how engaged employees are. We've heard a lot already at this conference about this, and I, I think uh, this is gonna be an interesting area for you to share as well, Deping. Yeah, so uh, the team used to look like a monolith, uh, layers upon layers. We have the front-end developer, we have back-end developer, we have the so-called cross-cut developer, which are there to uh, taking care of the framework building uh, part of it. And then, uh, uh, another very interesting story. So when I first joined, this project manager always came to me every day after uh, stand up and asking me the single question. Uh, for this feature, is this supposed to be front end or uh, back end or the cross cut? So uh, that kind of confusion is actually uh, very unfortunate. Then we say that why do we still kind of like uh, uh, giving people titles in terms of what do they do? And then uh, we look at not only about development team, we look at a little bit further, right? So then there will be the segregation between QA and then the uh, developers and also uh, the BAs. So we, we, we think, uh, at least actually right now, we are still having the conversation now, in a sense that why do we still give people a title? Uh, maybe we should only give one title to all of the people that is uh, relevant for the uh, for building the software. We should call them the software maker, right? So in the making of the software, there are different activities that need to carry out. And then uh, just because you are doing something does not mean that you have exclusive access to do only one activity. If you can do more than one, why not? So, uh, and then uh, the other one about the uh, automation again, right? So uh, there used to be this kind of like uh, invisible wall. My job is done, I throw over uh, the wall and then it's ops problem. And uh, uh, we have these uh, uh, so-called log aggregator setting up. All of the log actually piling up into a single uh, log mining system and alert system. Anytime there's a 500 error happening in the production, no matter what kind of like 500 error, it could be 501 or 502, anything, that will be actually automatically feedback to the development team. So the operation will not actually need to know what's there, uh, the exception happened in the production, but instead, uh, they are more actually looking at the uh, operation part of it or certainly right? looking at the capacity planning stuff like this. How about sustainable pace? Like you, you've shared with me when we talked about this, how you know if, if you're having developers work at almost every weekend and week, working weekends and deploying on weekends is normal, the you know engagement is often it's often not a very enjoyable job. So what changes have you seen in that area? Yep. So uh, when I first joined the bank, it used to be a, an uh, accepted norm where people can should work uh, overtime and uh, it's okay for you to come back Saturday Sunday. So uh, we don't we no longer do that. In a sense that by throwing more time into the uh, project, the ceiling, I mean, you can only scale the team uh, so much. The ceiling is actually very low. So uh, instead of we change the uh, team building philosophy uh, slightly, in a sense, can we look after the people and then transitively let the people look after the applications that's running production? 
right? So, uh, in fact, uh, most of the companies are actually a very good, uh, putting a lot of effort, emphasis on the starting uh, time of the, of the day. We put a lot more actually emphasis on the ending of the day, right? So 6.30, this is the time to cut off your work, and you should go home. <laughs> you should go home. And every time if you figure someone uh, actually uh, need to stay behind after 6.30, that's uh, actually a good opportunity for a conversation. Why uh, uh, do people need to stay back? Uh, is there a lack of support, lack of expertise, or lack of uh, planning? There has to be a reason. So uh, in terms of that, uh, I think uh, people are getting actually much happier, which shows on the next slide. And I really like this policy that if you do have to work a weekend, that you get twice as much time off during a weekday at your choosing, kind of when it's convenient after it. I think that's a real you know, sort of positive step towards engagement. But let's kind of finish off here in the last minute or so and talk about the improvements you've seen in kind of measurable engagement. Yeah, so uh, my first year uh, team engagement score uh, the survey came back to be only 66. Uh, I, I told myself, actually, not that bad. I can win the election by this much of uh, approval rate. <laughs> 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 However, it actually is not good enough at all, right? So you look at our department, uh, and average is about 80. So, uh, okay, so I say, never mind. Uh, we know our problem. Let's sort our problem out. And then the next year, it came out to be 89, which, is, which was pretty good. And then two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I have my uh, this year's score, which actually, guess what? It's actually about, it's actually exactly 100%. So, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I, I don't think 100% I don't, I don't means we are done. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do, right? So, but that does mean there's something where uh, you can see the, uh, the progression from 66 to 89, uh, all the way to 100. Okay. And yeah, there's another actually very interesting uh, talking about culture. I do see a lot of culture in this conference. I do, I love it. And then uh, um, there are a lot, lot of organizations, uh, they, all, they all say that uh, we are a learning organization, but where's the, where's the test for it, right? So and, uh, we run this uh, Launch and Learn series. Every Thursday uh, uh, lunchtime, we gather everybody together, and then we buy the food for them, and then we hopefully uh, someone will put up the topic and discuss. And then the topic can be very broad. Uh, uh, we have topics about credit risk uh, approving, and we have topics about the uh, latest and greatest technology. We even had a topic about black holes. I mean, uh, <laughs> so, so the, the idea is, uh, well, when we first started this series, it was really a pain uh, to kind of like, get the speakers there, because people just ten, generally speaking tend not to kind of speak in front of an uh, audience to share something. And then uh, these days, we have to set up a more like a, job scheduling uh, 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 stuff to make sure that uh, people don't fight too much on that slot of speaking, right? So that kind of sharing uh, mindset is already there. So I believe, personal belief, like uh, when you do have a learning uh, organization and you do have a learning culture, and then the sharing part is the ultimate test for whether you have passed that or not. Obviously, again, I don't think, I don't see that we have already kind of done. Uh, <laughs> so there's still a lot more to be done. So. Uh, but yes, we, we think we are in the right trajectory now. So I, I think that's a perfect spot to, to wrap things up here. I just want to thank Dapang, and let's give him a round of applause for coming and sharing the story. Yeah. Thanks very much.